So really quickly, my name is Ruth Ann Mowry. I am a visiting curator here at the Rare Book and Manuscript Library, and I'm joined by my colleague. Uh, Caroline, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Caroline Silovich. I'm another curator in the Rare Book and Manuscript Library, and I will be moderating comments and questions while Ruth Ann is presenting her finds. Right. So what I'm going to be doing for today is I have a couple of items that I have pulled from the collection and we're just going to spend some time with them. So this is an open house kind of format. If you have questions or comments or if you just like to have a chat about any of these things, feel free to drop it into the, uh, the comments on Zoom or the comments on YouTube, uh, open up your mic and we can have a conversation about those things. This is um, not a lecture where I'm just talking at you. This is meant as more of a conversation. So feel free to join us in whatever capacity you are comfortable. I love asking, answering questions. Caroline is also on the question boat. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go ahead and start setting up the, my share screen so that you can see the first item. Got a few more in the waiting room, get those in. Okay, so this is gonna be our first item. Now, before we get everything caught up, we're just gonna, I'm just gonna do a quick introduction to what RBML is in case um, you guys haven't heard our spiel before. So the Rare Book and Manuscript Library is a special collections unit on campus at the, I don't know, I apologize. My screen sharing says it is paused. We're going to do this one more time. Zoom share. All right, it seems we cannot have a Zoom session. It's not a Zoom session without technical difficulties. Okay, here we go. <laughs> the Rare Book and Manuscript Library is a special collections unit at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, we house the rare uh, books and a bunch of the archival materials. Um, we also have the university archives uh, in the division as well. For us, we have about 500,000 volumes and uh, 5,000 linear square feet of uh, miles of archival documents. I'm sorry, we will get, we'll get talking soon. And it's a really large collection. The oldest item in the collection is cuneiform tablets, which are about 2000 BCE. And we range all the way up to current things that are produced in 2020, 2021. Uh, things like artist books or fine press things that are coming out in uh, the current time frame, and we have a whole range of things. So I mentioned the cuneiform tablets and fine press books and artist books, but we also have very large holdings for um, history of science, specifically math. We have a large economics collection. We are a land grant university, which means we have a whole slew of agricultural and um, animal husbandry type of books. We also have a very large Shakespeare collection. Uh, we have the papers are from Estelle Proust. So a wide ranging variety of things from all types of different things in here. And we like to say that if you're looking for something, we probably have it. And if we don't, we can at least point you in the right direction. Uh, one of the really cool things about this collection that I wanna point out, uh, right now we are currently closed due to the pandemic, uh, but under normal circumstances, we are an access kind of collection. We are a public university, which means that everyone has access to these materials. So when we do open up to the public again, you are more than welcome to come in and request an item and spend some time in our reading room with those items, item or items, and spend some quality time with it. And there are no restrictions on what you can see or what you can't see. And if you really would like to come in and see the, uh, the first edition of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, we can definitely accommodate that. So if you're interested in anything, you can always shoot us an email and or stay up to date with us on our event page. Um, we'll give you the up-to-date information when we do start taking appointments again. And you can also see what our event schedule will be like for the rest of the semester and next semester as well. Okay. I feel like I've given the spiel. Please feel free to stop me if I, there are questions or comments. <laughs> we, uh, 
Is there anything you want to chime in with before we start looking at uh, the patience game, Caroline? Uh, no, girl, eagerly awaiting the opening <laughs> of box. Opening of the box. Okay. So I'm going to try and do this without the light because it gives a, a weird glare. But if it is too dark, just let me know and I will go ahead and um, turn that back on. So, okay, so we can all see. Oh, and my document camera is up here. So when I'm awkwardly raising my hand, it's I'm adjusting the document camera, I promise. Okay, so this is a little item in our collection. And for reference, it, my hand. So you can see how, uh, how small this is. This is one of those fits in the palm of your hands kind of game. And this is called Selected Patients Games. Zoom in on that a little bit so everyone can see. Oh, there we go. And if that's the picture is ever not clear for anybody, please feel free to let me know about that too. Okay, so uh, this little uh, piece is from uh, London and it was published by Thomas De La Rue and Company and Chas Goodall and Son in 1930. This would have been a little card game that you could sit around and play. Inside the, uh, in the book, there's rules and things on how to play these, but we'll get, we'll get back to that one. What I love about this one is uh, these little cards. They're so cute and tiny. I don't know how many of you feel the same way, but when you see tiny things, like little tiny, oh, they're just so adorable. <laughs> okay, so. Let me move this up just a second here. So we talked before, I showed you before about my hand <laughs> and the size of what these are. So as you can see, palm of my hand, these little cards, they're tiny little guys. They fit directly into the palm of my hand, so. If anyone has played card games, could you imagine sitting with your little cards and <laughs> this is all the little card space that you have? <laughs> so, does anyone play any card games that they think would be, uh, I don't know, advantageous to have these little, little tiny ones? It might be good for travel. That, that is true. They conveniently fit in your pocket. For people with small hands. Mm -hmm. Very true, very true. Here's the question everyone wants, I'm sure. What games do we play with these tiny cards, right? Okay, so let's see. Okay, so the deck or the decks come with this little instruction booklet, right? And it gives you a short introduction, ranging cards, pretty standard for card games. But when we get into here, can everyone see this okay? There we go. This game is called The Star. Okay, so is anyone else confused over here by the remaining seven kings are thrown aside? Well, it looks like you're keeping just one king of hearts. Right, but isn't is there only one king of hearts? <laughs> There's two kings of hearts. If you have two decks and then you discard all the other kings. Okay. You want to see another one? I'll see another one. Yeah. There was one in here that I thought was really cute. It's closer to the center. So having duly shuffled the two packs together, take the first 13 cards that come to hand, look them over, and if they are duplicates in point of value, return one of them to the pack and take another 
so that the 13 cards, though not arranged in any regular order, shall in fact form a complete sequence irrespective of suit. Place these 13 cards squared together face upwards on the table. I mean, if you're interested in learning how to play <laughs> any card games from the 1930s, ooh, hey, backbone with a patient with patience. So what seems to be what most of these games are playing is you're playing with both card decks. So you would have this little guy out as well. This one's just the same, just red on the back instead of blue. Also very tiny. Okay, are we ready for another item? Any questions, comments? I think we're all following along so far, so yeah. Okay. You guys get to watch me put all of the things away too. It's the joy of uh, doing this on the document camera. You can watch me take them out and put them away. So you get a little bit more of a uh, look behind the scenes about how we handle the material. Ta -da. Okay, that one is the patient one. Okay, so the next one I'm gonna pull out. This is the box for it. Okay. Uh, Caroline, my yeah. French, would you mind, please? This is the Ancien Tarot de Marseille. A tarot Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, my French is awful, <laughs> so uh, this is a tarot that we have in the collection. Um, it was, it's in from Paris, its publisher was Grimaud, and this particular one is from 1963. So, a little bit of history on tarot, if you are specifically this one, tarot Masai, Marseille, Marseille, Marseille. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this one in particular um, is one of the standard patterns for the design of tarot cards, which means that um, all of the ones that came after it, uh, the design decks, they, uh, they kind of look like this in their design or they take after it in some kind of attributive way. And According to Michael Dummett, who was a British professor at the University of Oxford, and he studied analytic philosophy, um, the tarot deck was probably invented in Northern Italy in the 15th century, and then it was introduced into Southern France when the French conquered Milan and Piedmont in 1499. Uh, the pre precursors <laughs> to this particular tarot uh, were then brought into Southern France around that time. And essentially all Italian suited tarot decks outside of Italy are descended from the, the Milan Marseille uh, type with the exception of some of the early French and Belgian packs, which have a little bit of a different influence. And a little bit of trivia for you, the earliest surviving cards of this pattern, this particular pattern are made by Jean Noblet of Paris and they are from 1650. So pretty old cards. What's really cool about this one is this one is from 1963. And I mean, it's, it's not 1650, but it's still pretty cool. Um, inside the box, so this is the box, it comes with all that. You get the, the manual that goes with that. Uh, most of the time when you buy a tarot deck, you're also going to get, most decks come with a manual that come with them too. And this is the deck. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit more. Okay, so this is the deck for this particular tarot. So I try not to spill 78 cards all over the place. And so you can see it uses a very uh, red, blue, and yellow palette and uh, these kinds of drawings. Uh, this particular one uses swords, cups, uh, coins, and wands. So if you're familiar with that, um, let me see if I can find some. If you have questions, feel free to stop me or any of things like that. So this one is a sword. Oh, here's some coins. Lots of coins. 
Unfortunately, if we're not in the room with you, we can't draw the cards for you to read our fortune. So. No, unfortunately, I am. I do not possess the skill set to do virtual. <laughs> Okay, so one of the really nice things about this, and it kind of segues into what Caroline was mentioning with uh, doing readings, is um, we started working with pulling our board games out and using them in our outreach programs. Um, specifically, there's a historical board game that we're going to get to in just a little bit. Um, and we pulled them out because we wanted people to be able to play with them in the collection. and. Some of them have a really cool way of looking at learning history or cultural or societal things from their specific time frame, And we wanted to pull the tarot out as well, but there's, if you've ever used tarot, uh, the cards themselves, you know that with extended use, they tend to get worn down. And that's not necessarily something that we were looking to do with a deck from 1963. So what we went ahead and did is, we spoke with the Beinecke and the Beinecke has this, the same deck, the, the same one. Theirs is just from 1930. So it's a little bit earlier. And we asked them if it would be okay to create a facsimile using their deck. So we printed a facsimile deck that we could actually use. And facsimile means it's just an exact replica. So their cards do a little bit different they were published 30 years differently. But theirs have some of the red, or sorry, the black around the outside as, instead of the white. And the back of their cards are more tannish instead of the white that you see from the art deck, which is in the 60s. So what we did was we made an exact replica. So the card and then the back. And these are just printed onto, I don't know if you can see, it's just cardstock. But these are the cards that we use when we do bring them out so that people can handle them without having to worry about potentially damaging or wearing down the cards from the original version. These are actually kind of cool. We've actually brought them out at a couple of events. Y'all with me so far? <laughs> We're still here. Okay, just making sure. Do we have any questions about tarot or any of these things? Julie was asking in chat whether, how we obtained those cards, were they donated to the university? And my answer was, I believe these were straight acquisitions, but perhaps you know more than I do. Yes, so there is a, um, a specific fund for this. Um, it's managed by Shell, um, which is the social sciences. Um, oh my goodness, Caroline, I'm, I'm losing the acronym. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the social as we put each other on the spot, right? <laughs> and they it's... have a fund for uh, yes, uh, but yes, and occult. Matters. Yes, they, uh, the Mandeville Collection is um, parapsychology and occult studies, and they have the funds, and they buy. Uh, sometimes they buy tarot decks, but because their um, collection is. Some of the Mandeville collection is housed in like the main library stacks and some of them are like open stacks. Um, sometimes when they're more rare or high value items, um, they'll put them in our care um, so that they are more secure. And because these are decks from 1963 that have a bit of value attached to them, that's why they live in our collection. So we have, we have a nice relationship going with uh, Shell with uh, the tarot decks and other occult items. Ruthan, we do have a question in chat. Mm -hmm. Since you mentioned other games, how many tabletop games are, do we have in the collection? Oh my goodness, that is a fantastic question. Um, let's see if I can, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight to 10 of them. At least, sorry. Yeah. I have to picture the shelf where they all live. Um, there's about eight to 10 of them um, in the collection and I have one of them here today. So I will pull them out. Um, they range, one of them is a French lottery game which Caroline knows the most information about. So I'll let Caroline take that one. 
well, it is just one of these uh, fairly common lotto games. It's just themed with, uh, I think it's also meant to be a little bit of a language acquisition game where you just draw little numbers on little wooden tokens from a bag. And it's just like a bingo game. And you get these little cards with numbers and little illustrations and whoever fills their card first wins possibly the prize. Um, and these were produced in many, 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 many different themes to suit fashions. And... Uh, we also have a fortune teller game. Um, right before we went on lockdown in March of 2020, which seems so long ago, <laughs> we were working on creating the facsimile for that one because um, that one is like, it's got a base. I don't know if you can see my hands. Uh, it's got like a base and then it has tops that go on top of it um, that kind of like lock into pegs and then you spin them. And for obvious reasons, we can't be doing that with the original. Um, so we digitized it and we were going to create the facsimile so that we could actually play the fortune teller game. And um, Got a little bit of a sidetrack because of the lockdown and the pandemic, but we're going to pick that one back up because it's um, it's an easy to pick up and learn how to play game, which is really important when we're looking for board games that we can use in the classroom or outreach events, because who wants to spend 45 minutes learning how to play a tabletop game <laughs> in a 50 minute class, though. So look at those. And then the one I have over here is uh, Mansion of Happiness, and it's a late 1800s board game. And that's the one I pull out the most because we have that one done already. So we have lots. Yeah. I guess that's one of our challenges in the rare book and manuscript library that we try to acquire uh, actual pieces from maybe a century ago and games tend to be worn out and thrown away. So there aren't that many copies remaining. And when they do remain, they come to us already quite old and worn out. And continuing to play with these artifacts, we just put more wear and tear. So we want to share them, we want people to play with them, but we end up having to try to produce facsimiles so that the original pieces will last a while longer. Okay, any other questions about tarot? I can answer them while I'm, we'll move on to the, the next one. No, I think we're curious to see what else you have in store. This next one's going to be good. <laughs> I'm personally hyped up about this one because it's so weird. I'm going to hype the whole thing up too. It's weird. Oh, and Laura, a few minutes ago, supplied that Michelle Library is officially the social sciences, health, and education library. We should actually with our colleagues in the official way. There. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Okay, so this next item, as I awkwardly reach into my little envelope here, this item is from the Wells Collection, the H.G. Wells Collection. I'm just gonna show you the envelope really quick. Um, it's a ladies rouge box, uh, supposedly Jane, who is uh, one of Wells' wives with a lock of braided hair and a tiny watercolor head of a lady enclosed in lid under glass. Oh, you know, we didn't mention this before, but I feel like I should probably point this out. Um, realia is the term for these objects. So like when, like when you think of a library, um, you think of like books and things like that, right? And in a special collections library that also is expanded to think about like um, archival materials as well. But what we're trying to do here today is show you that we can have, we have lots of really cool and weird things. Uh, there are lots of things in here, uh, even some things that are larger than what I've pulled. They just don't do well on either the document camera. Ooh. Okay, so <laughs> this one is weird and I absolutely adore it and it's fantastic. So Wells Collection, H.G. Wells Collection, right? I mentioned this is supposedly Jane's hair. Of course, there's no way to know for sure um, without, I guess, testing. So I'm not even sure we'd have DNA from Jane. Anyway, that's a that's a tangent. Um, but Jane was Wells' second wife. And if um, you want more trivia, Jane Wells' first wife was, uh, her name was Isabel. They were cousins. 
uh, Jane or Wells and Jane met and uh, Isabel and HG decided uh, they were going to split. Uh, Jane was Wells' student and then they also got married and they got married in October of 1895. They had two children, uh, George Philip and Frank Richard. And then Jane ultimately, uh, she passed on October 6th of 1927. So if you know anything about Wells, <laughs> that's not abnormal. So <laughs> the interesting and the really like weird thing that I particularly enjoy about this is the hair. And one of my favorite questions that people always ask when they come in and talk to us and they're like, so what is, what's the weirdest item in your collection? Any, any guesses <laughs> as to what mine might be? I can do one. <laughs> can you zoom in a little bit? Perhaps? Yeah, of course, totally. We can see the portrait that is. Okay, auto zoom, auto focus, okay. So uh, in the, uh, the Victorian era, uh, which is uh, the mid to the late 1800s uh, during the reign of Queen Victoria. Uh, jewelry was frequently made with human hair and it was very popular. Uh, lots of women's wear styles uh, featured human hair, um, especially if the uh, person the hair belonged to was deceased. So um, loved ones and family members could give tokens of hair if uh, tokens of love and friendship in letters and gifts and often that would be hair. So for example, if I'm remembering correctly, there is a, a letter from Edgar Allan Poe to his significant other that has a lot of hair in it. And if we're talking the 1800s, it's not like you can very easily send anything else of yourself. So at least sending a lock of your hair, you're still sending a piece of yourself to your beloved, right? And so this also held true for after a person's death. So their hair, I mean, your hair remains for a bit. And so it was a tangible keepsake that loved ones or family or friends keep of the person who was deceased and you'd be able to take it with you when you went or wherever you went. Um, there's a little bit of roots in um, relic culture, like uh, saints relics and things like that. So it wasn't completely abnormal for body parts to have a significant cultural meaning. Um, I know that we look at it now as kind of weird, but um, if any of you are parents or new parents or are familiar with parents who cut like little locks, like their baby's first curl off of their hair and put it like in a keepsake for baby's first curl or things like that. I mean, so people still kind of do this today, but when people are asking, hey, what's the weirdest thing in your collection? Hair. It's hair. There's a lot of hair in our collection. Well, how weird do we want to be? Because in the same time period with the advent of photography, there is also an even weirder tradition, weirder for yeah. our modern sensibility. Yes. Which perhaps take a photo of a deceased family member posed in a lifelike <laughs> together with a living family member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was especially popular with babies and young children. Of course, the mortality rate for little ones was higher, but um, sometimes that's the only way they would have to remember a little one. And so they would, they would pose the baby. And I know that we think it's weird, but the relationship that they had with death didn't look like the one that we have now. This is a little different. Oh, I have not opened. So if you're unfamiliar with what a rouge box is, it's just, this is a little container and inside of it, you can still kind of see the little, the little pigments right there. You keep your makeup like your blush or whatever your preference was. And then on the other side, there's just the, what's holding in the, the hair and things like that. So that box is now empty, correct? Yes. Yeah, there's nothing in that. It probably would not be very safe <laughs> to leave uh, makeup in this in the collection. If you can see right here, I don't know, can y'all see? Oh, my fingers are totally in the way. This uh, There's handwriting right here. 
So this is probably, it looks like a scrap of paper that someone used to help hold everything in. Kind of cool. So how are we feeling about this rouge box and hair? And so I'm wondering, is that supposed to be then the little miniature, is that supposed to be Jane Wells? Honestly, I have no is that a box that belonged to her during her lifetime and then might be maybe her mother's hair? Or? Maybe. Um, Jane had boys, like Jane and HG had boys, so I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe a water box. That's something she would have used during her lifetime, so perhaps well, maybe her mother's hair? Or Maybe. Interesting. And mysterious. <laughs> That's kind of the beauty of some of these archival items is sometimes you just get stuff and you don't know where it comes from. <laughs> a little bit of a mystery. <laughs> so what do y'all think about the hair? Do we have opinions, comments, questions? Who's blonde hair? Hmm? Who's blonde hair? It looks like it. Here, let me see if I can I'll bring it to you. Autofocus, engage. No, okay. It's not gonna focus. Well, I think you're too close now. <laughs> okay. Maybe there. Yeah, it's hard to see, but yeah, it looks like um, a blonde, maybe a darker blonde. Oh, we have another question. Mm -hmm. What are the criteria for placement of items into RBML? Maybe value, age, uniqueness, etc. Who decides? Yeah, so that's a great question. One that we we answer that one. Uh, it's a very popular question. Um, so you list a lot of the things that. Um, Kind of make an item rare and then uh, the students come in and we ask it my typical I like to make this into a critical thinking question but if you have if you spend uh, what, what is an average book price we'll say $25 on a book and it goes into main stacks and something happens to the book it's it's okay as typically you can buy another one and it was at the end of the day $25 and when you're talking about large collections it's, it's not the end of the world if something happens. However, if we're talking about a one of a kind item that this is the only one available, for example, like this rouge box, this is the only one available. Um, or if we're talking about items that are really expensive, we're paying, uh, it was a $5,000 item. Those types of things don't go out into the main stocks. Those things would come here because there, it's a more secure location to keep them. We keep items in temperature and humidity controlled location. So they're safer, they're happier. <laughs> they get preserved for future generations and those types of things. So qualifications for inclusion are how rare is the book? For example, is it a print on demand copy or is it a first edition of Sir Isaac Newton? <laughs> um, the value of the book, are we spending lots of money on this or is it's something that is not quite so out there. Um, and then archival materials are rarity, scarcity of items and things like that. Um, a lot of items come to our collection through purchase. So we will, we look through bookseller catalogs and things like that and we'll purchase items. We also have a lot of very generous donors who give us lovely gifts that we always appreciate and contribute to the collection in that way. Um, on occasion also, because the university is so old, what, 1837, it's a very old university. That means that, you know, when the university first opened, <laughs> a book from 1850 was, was current, right? Um, but now it's not, it's, it's more rare. So uh, when you have older libraries on campus that were um, very specific to a certain area of expertise when those close down or when they realize or when they think and they're like oh hey this this item is a little bit older um we take items from around campus as well and we'll add them to our collection where they can be 
safe and a little chilly and not very humid and uh, kept for future generations and all of that. Do you want to add more, Caroline? And I would say for the part of the question as to who decides um, that is a collegial process. First, uh, the curators in the rare book and manuscript library, that would be you, me, our colleague Adam, Kate, our director, Lynn, um, will try to see if an item is a good fit for the collections that we maintain because we can't collect the entire world. But it's also conversations with other colleagues throughout the university library who can help us gauge the value and uh, significance of the materials we're considering. So it's, um, it's a pretty collegial process. It's a very interesting question. All right. Are we ready for another one? This one's a board game. Sorry. Oh, sorry. You can see. <laughs> we just we are very nicely putting it back onto the envelope. Okay. So this is one of those board games. I I must confess, I probably would have made y'all play with me if we were uh, in person because I love this game. It's my personal favorite. Okay, so the first aspect I'm gonna show you is the original and then I'm gonna get the facsimile because the original is um, it's not in the best of shape. And so I don't wanna to put too much stress on it, but this is the original. This is the Mansion of Happiness. Um, let me get my date. It was published by D.P. Ives and Company uh, in Boston, S.P. Ives in Massachusetts, uh, about 1866. Um, this board game specifically, as you can see, the condition is, is a bit rough. It's separated here. It's been well played. Yes, it was very well loved. Um, this is a board game based on Christian morality. And uh, when we get the facsimile, I'll zoom in so you can see uh, in more detail about all of those. But for now, we'll do the, we'll do the high up. Um, the, um, it was designed by George Fox, who was a children's author, game designer in England. And uh, the first edition of this one, in particular, like this version of the game, um, had supposedly gold in its illustrations and it was watercoloring, hand painted. Only a couple hundred were made. And of course, very wealthy people could afford these. And that was about it. It was not a game that um, was popular with the masses because it was obviously prohibitively expensive. Uh, their second edition was um, pitched at a lower price point. Uh, there wasn't gold and there wasn't watercoloring. Uh, they uh, did a little better quality on the just coloring them in with the plates. And um, that one was pitched for more middle-class individuals so that you didn't have to be ultra wealthy to be able to afford it as well. Um, and then in, uh, let me get my date, in the mid to late 1800s, um, it came over to the US and the, um, the SB Ives in Salem that I mentioned earlier started doing the publishing of it in the US. And um, then Parker Brothers, and the most people are familiar, like the, the really big uh, game company that's still around these days, um, bought the rights to it in 1894. And then they continued producing it until about 1926. So uh, some places say that it's the first board game published in uh, the United States. It's, it's not technically, um, there was another one. It's uh, the Traveler's Logbook from like 1822. Uh, this one is um, like 1840s to 1860s with, around the time frame that ours is in. Um, but I mean, it's pretty close. It's only 20 years off. Uh, board games weren't mass produced like uh, they are now back then. So it was pretty close to being the first one. However, it is the longest continuously published board game that has a known designer. So the George Fox, the, the first one. So like checkers and chess obviously they've been produced a lot longer than this but people don't know who the original designer for those were so this one gets the title for knowing the designer and it was continuously published from 1800 to 1926. 
Okay, so I'm gonna get the facsimile out. Oh, and the back is just more of the same backing. All right, so while I'm doing that, if you have any questions, feel free to send them over. Reach over to my little table. How do you game come with the little tokens or dice? Or do we have to supply them? I'm sorry, one more time. For this, for this game, you needed, I guess, a die or a pair of dice and yes. some little tokens. Did our yes. company include those or do we have to supply no. them? So, <laughs> um, my colleague, Siobhan McKissick, she is the archivist here. Fabulous. Um, she is the one who helped me out with these projects. And the Mansion of Happiness is, she actually created the facsimile for this. Um, our wonderful digitization services took uh, the images for it. And then it's just on, I don't know if you can see this. It's just like foam core. I, mean, I don't know if you can get my clicking app, but it's, um, it's just a facsimile copy so that we can take it out and play it with people. But of course, you all saw the damage for the original. We don't want to mess with that one any further. So that's why we did this. The other thing is it doesn't have the parts. And this is really common for board games. Okay, how many of you have a board game at home that you've just lost <laughs> half the pieces to? I'm one of those people. So it happens, they're small pieces. I mean, they, they move around. So what we, uh, what Siobhan did was she went and she did a little bit of research and there are a couple of museums who have um, a few of the pieces so that she could kind of rate what, um, what they might look like. And as I struggle to untie the little box here, you can watch me struggle with string. Oh my goodness. I can untie things. Okay, here we go. So <laughs> what this game was originally played with was a, uh, it's a teetotum. If you don't know what a teetotum is, it kind of looks like a little top that you just kind of put down and you spin. And what these uh, flat edges, what they land on, I don't know if you can see how, like but what it'll land on is the number that you get. So um, Siobhan made a, wow. a replica one that we could play, that we could use to play with. So like, I just put the dowel through the, the center of the, the thing. And then it's, oh, hold on. Use your air, I put it in backwards. <laughs> okay. So then you just, you spin it and it kind of works like a top. And so you see it fell. And um, I don't know if you can see that, but that's a four down there. So I would move four spaces and that's what a teetotum is. And that's how you could spin them. Obviously when they were produced the games, they were a little better quality than our facsimile. <laughs> This is a uh, not historically accurate, accurate replica, which is also followed by our not historically accurate pawns. Oh dear. <laughs> we we're not able to recreate the pawns. We aren't sure. So um, we had some erasers <laughs> that are around. So we have some uh, farm animal pawns. They are adorable. <laughs> So this is, the, of course, the issue that you run into with games. You lose the pieces. And so uh, we weren't able to replicate them, but you kind of get the gist that there's there's little farm animals here. And then you've got the, you can also do it with the, oh, you can't see there, but these are just cardboard squares, three discs. Sorry, the reflection's really bad. And then Siobhan very helpfully made this little case to go with them. So we have our tea totem, we have our little farm animals. All right, so <laughs> you can see why this is one of my favorites. So um, if you've ever played like Life or Candyland, so the game is that kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Style? Oh. Yeah, like you, you, hey. play, you play around in the circle and it just spirals into the center. Um, but the important thing about this one, I'm going to try and get really close so you guys can see. Um, so you see the pictures. So we have justice and piety. And so each space is numbered. There's 67 spaces. There are certain things that you do on certain spaces. There's a, we have a little instruction that comes with it. Um, so you see like justice and piety. So those are, you know, for morality, they're great. You can move forward, all of those things. Um, can you show the title? Because the image was a little, yeah. Let's, oh, yes. let's look at the title at the top of the board for a second. 
of course. An instructive, moral, and entertaining amusement. Mm -hmm. That's quite a program. So you can see water here. Actually, I have the instructions. And I think water is the one. Siobhan also made us a helpful little list. Thank you, Siobhan. <laughs> So when you hit water, you do something like each of these. Okay. So when you hit water, you pay one to move 10. If you can, you can see this list. Um, there's lots of things. Okay. So audacity is number seven. So you see audacity right here. Um, audacity, if you are um, there, if you land there, you have to go back to the previous place. So for things that don't fit into like the, the moral things that they're they're getting at with this um you have to do um like moving backwards or you're stuck in something or oh, like um, the stocks i see the stocks yes number so there, there's a lot Go to okay i'm going to turn this around so you use okay so here we go we have idleness and prudence the green ones are the free spaces you, nothing happens to you there you have cruelty. That one's the whipping post. Mm -hmm. This one is truth. This one is immodesty. That's the road to folly. That's the Sabbath breaker. It's the house of correction. That one's chastity. Oh, hold on. <laughs> that is a terrifying game. <laughs> Sincerity, uh, cheat, the pillory. There's the stocks, Caroline. Mm -hmm. um, this is humility. Oh, wait, no. Sorry. Here is... I just had it, where to go? The stocks, the actual stock. Um, industry, a perjurer, can you see the perjurer? Okay. And then parody, there's a drunkard right here. Um, and then we get into the, um, the closer ones. There's a robber over here, the seat of expectation. Um, the, but to get into the center, what's really difficult about this game is you have to do an exact roll. So if you are on C4 and you roll a five, you're not getting to 67 and you have to start the game all over again. You go back to one. <laughs> so if you don't make it in exactly, you have to go back to one if you overshoot and then do the whole thing over again. So it plays like you can get to the center pretty quickly, um, but actually winning the game is actually pretty complicated. <laughs> Um, in the comments, Katie said, great job to Savan, I guess, for the reconstruction of all yes. the parts. And also a question, is the game actually fun to play? Well, you tell us, Katie, what do you think with all these moral traps? <laughs> I have to, <laughs> it's fun. Um, we took it to um, the undergraduate library. Um, this was back before pandemic. They had a uh, gaming event and they were hosting a whole bunch of different, uh, there's like a Pathfinder game, there's some Super Mario Kart happening. And Siobhan and, uh, and I took a Mansion of Happiness and our colleague Kate brought uh, the, the tarot deck that I had showed you. And we went and we sat down there and we asked everyone who was doing all these modern games, hey, do you wanna play a Victorian board game with us? <laughs> uh, surprisingly, there was only a few takers, <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, for us, the humor and the enjoyment of this game comes from um, these things, the, the, what you land on. Uh, so like for the Sabbath breaker, I do not know if you can see these things, but I'll read it to you. The Sabbath breaker, which is number 28, the, the penalty for landing on Sabbath breaker is pay a fine of one and go to the whipping post, which is behind us, number 22. There's another one that is gets us every time. Okay, passion, which is number 14, you pay a fine and you go to the water. You are too passionate. You have to, you have to cool off in that cool water, <laughs> right? So um, there's a lot of humor in this, <laughs> but if we're using it to teach in a classroom setting, there's also a lot that you can learn and gain from this when we're talking about Victorian uh, societal norms and cultures and those types of things because you get a different look at society from board games than you do from like literature. So it's a, I think it's a pretty cool way to look at it. And it's, it gets students engaged and doing the same kind of things that Victorians would do.
Well, and I suppose the message is pretty clear in the game that if you land on some of these sinful behaviors, you will be held back, sent back. And yes. if you land on the good virtue squares, you will yes. head mm -hmm. forward towards a life of happiness. So what do y'all think? Would you, would you play this? Oh, as a child, I used to play an equivalent game, which was sort of the game of the goose, le jeu de loi, which was something like a chase like that with traps and penalties. And, but I guess the, the moral layer had been removed by then. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm not gonna struggle to put this away <laughs> while we're doing this. I'm just gonna put this away. Um, so I have one more item that I'm gonna do is also a fan favorite. Oh, excuse me, it's a little further back. Okay. So this one is also one of the uh, favorites to pull. Okay, so who, who all knows who Gwendolyn Brooks is? Okay. I see my the chat flashing. I'm going to assume at least some people know who Gwendolyn Brooks is. I should open my chat. I have an answer. She was a poet. Yes. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. I ask these things and I don't even have my chat open, so I apologize. So for those of you who don't know, um, uh, the Rare Book and Manuscript Library has a Gwendolyn, Bro Gwendolyn Brooks archival collection. It is very large. <laughs> And um, it is fantastic, like it's great. So a little bit of background, Gwendolyn Brooks is an American poet, author and teacher and a lifelong resident of Chicago. So she's local. Um, her work often dealt with the personal celebrations and struggles of ordinary people in her community. And what is super cool is she was the first black individual to receive a Pulitzer Prize for poetry on May 1st, 1950, and that was for Annie Allen. Um, she was also named Poet Laureate, Poet Laureate, I'm sorry, of Illinois in 1968, and that is a position that she held in her, until her death 32 years later. She was also named the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry to the Library of Congress for the 1985-86 term, and in 1976, 1976, oh my goodness, she became the first black woman inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Fantastic author, guys, wonderful. And two things, <laughs> first, one of the other popular things that I like to pull that I think is really, it really highlights what is great about the collection is um, for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, there's a notebook in the collection and when you open it, it looks like a standard, like address, memory, jot down your memos kind of notebook. But um, when you go through it and you get to a, just a random page in the center of it, um, she has like this handwritten note in there that just says, I humbly accept the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> and it's her reaction to receiving the news that she had won this really big prestigious award. And it's just so cool to be able to see how she like reacted to it and her personal feelings about those things. And then underneath of it, she has lists of the people who like called and congratulated her. And they start out with like their name and some information about what they said. And then as more people, like the, the list grows longer, it just starts being like names and things like that. So, but it's a really fantastic piece. And I highly encourage if you are able to, when, uh, we are open to the public again to come in and spend some time with the Brooks Collection because it's it's great. You really kind of get to see behind the scenes of a really fantastic poet and author. Now, off of my spiel, <laughs> this is her recipe box. Do, 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 do. Oh, this one is going to be a little bit more, you're going to get more of a top. I'll try and um, angle it. Oh, that's not going to work. Let's do it this way. So you can kind of see <laughs> Um, the tabs are mine. Um, everything else are things that she folded up and put in here. And they range from like uh, baking recipes to um, uh, the like the Dear Abby columns, like the advice columns that people used to like when they were in 
newspapers you could write in and get advice out of them so some of them are like uh, health related advice questions some of them are like raising children those types of questions um, I have two that I would really like to pull for you the first one is her orange cake recipe and so move this over just a tiny bit oh also as a just a note we are coming up to two o'clock. If you are able to stay longer, please feel free to do so. If you are not, thank you so much for stopping by. <laughs> we love having people come and take a look at our material and spend some time and ask questions with it. Um, if you have any other questions or comments or things you think of after the session, you can always email us. Our email is, um, Caroline will drop it in the chat, but it's uh, askacurator at library.illinois.edu. And uh, we always love to hear from y'all. <laughs> so feel free to reach out. If you are staying, um, we'll wrap up with the Brooks box. And then if you have anything you'd like to talk about or things like that, we'll be sticking around for a little bit longer. So this is her orange cake recipe. We have made it for events and it's delicious. <laughs> Caroline, have you, you were here for some of the events that they oh, made yeah. it. Yeah, had many shares of that famous orange cake. It was absolutely yummy. And I will perhaps put in a shameless plug that will get me in trouble. Probably I'm going against all sorts of university regulations, but I will point out that the baker Rick in downtown Nirvana has been our supplier of Gwendolyn Brooks orange cake on several occasions. He has the recipe, he knows how to make it. You could go and ask him. Also, if I know it's, not in the not in person thing, but if you ever do stop by, we created facsimiles of the orange cake and her light and dark cake, which is also really popular. Um, and you can take those home with you too. No, we're not open. I'm sorry. One day the pandemic will be over. <laughs> okay, so that's the orange cake. Very nicely, perhaps we'll consider remaining one to you. All right, and my personal favorite <laughs> is this one. Y'all can't read it. That says the cure for hiccups. That's really very. Okay. So uh, this is a little glary too. I'll read this one to you too. So the cure for hiccups. Um, apparently she got it from the art link letter program. You put your hands on your neck with thumbs touching, take a deep breath and press hard. A sure cure. Oh dear. And yes, it is choking yourself. Please do not choke yourself. But um, for a fact, when you're, when you're in a classroom full of people and you've pulled this out and you're talking to them about the contents of the recipe and you've read them the cure for hiccups and you see five people start trying to choke themselves. Yes, it has happened. <laughs> and she's like, no, 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 don't choke yourself. But so she had a whole bunch of different stuff in the recipe box and there's a whole bunch of cool things in here. And what's quite interesting is that this is a modern recipe book where clearly she kept little clippings and handwritten copied recipes, but also this cure for hiccups, while well, it's a joke that I get now, um, it ties back to a long, long, long tradition of uh, books and recipes, collections of recipes. We have some going back as early as the 16th century where food recipes as well as uh, remedies and cures were all collected together. Mm -hmm. So this is a very modern end to a long, long tradition where food and medicine were tied and linked and collected together in books and collections. Do we have questions? Do we have comments? People can just unmute themselves and talk directly with Ethan if you want. Um, we would like to see something again because sometimes the image can be a little jumpy on our side. Um, yes, and my hands do shake, I'm sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> some of that is my fault. I'm gonna stop sharing for now, but it is only a click away if we'd like to see anything else. Yeah, this, this is Nancy Creason. And I was wondering, 
what the word patience has to do with that card game. Hmm. Let's see. Let me all screen share again, and we'll read the in, I'll read the introduction of the booklet and see if that gives any. <laughs> hopefully, it gives an indication. Okay. Okay, so the prophet, pre oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. It's a Friday afternoon. Uh, the present booklet is the outcome of a popular desire to have in the smallest possible compass, a handbook of the best patients games. The items here printed have been carefully chosen and for the most part represent a medium standard of difficulty. Okay, that was not super helpful. Well, I can perhaps supply a possible yeah, somebody in chat, Kathleen, says that patience is an old name for solitaire type games. And I was oh. going to be in France where we play these various forms of solitaire games, that is uh, games for just one card player. They're called patience, because I guess that's something you play when you're bored or you have to keep patient. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Okay. The shaking is me. I am sorry. That these are all games played for one, just one player. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which would um, explain the solitaire connection. Which means just yeah, just lone player. Oh, and that gets into the the how to play. So that would be was an excellent question, and it's because it's solitaire. Cool. Well, it's perfect for pandemic times when you can't play with anyone. <laughs> Do we have other questions or comments for we time today? If not, perhaps it's time to wish everybody a happy afternoon, good afternoon, and maybe a good weekend. Mm -hmm. and thank you, Ruthanne, for putting together this interesting little selection on non-book objects of Realia. And as Ruthanne mentioned earlier, as soon as we get the go-ahead and the library can reopen to the public, you will be very, very welcome to come visit us in person and ask to see these objects and anything else from our collection for yourselves. We can't wait to be able to share things with the public. Yeah. <laughs> we really miss having people. Yeah. In. And thank you, to Carrie Lynchheit in the background, who's been operating the uh, YouTube and Zoom accounts for us. Yes, thank you so much, Carrie. <laughs> All, right. All right. Everyone have a great weekend. Thanks for stopping by.